good afternoon and thank you all for joining us virtually for our post-budget town hall. We usually have hundreds of people sitting inside of our Manny Cantor Center, the Education Alliance. And um, for those of you who I haven't had the opportunity to say hello to, um, as all of you know, I am Yulene New and I'm the assembly member for the 65th district, which covers lower Manhattan. And I wanted to take this time and moment to give a special thanks to our panelists today and also to all the elected officials um, who are joining us today uh, for taking the time um, to help us to improve our understanding of the issues uh, that we face together as a community. Um, I also wanted to thank the constituents and the New Yorkers who are joining us today um, from three different kinds of feeds. And uh, today, um, I just wanted to make sure that folks are getting their answers, uh, their questions answered and the answers that they want to uh, know about, uh, about the laws that are being passed and the uh, budget uh, that was passed and the cuts that are coming. And so uh, I'm just so happy to be here today with all of you for our post-budget town hall. Uh, first, I want to quickly explain how our town hall works. So usually um, we have note cards, etc., and they're color coded and very, very organized and people can ask questions live. But um, right now, because of how uh, the Zoom atmosphere has become and because of how like we are now doing uh, presentations and uh, meetings through um, different applications, we wanted to make sure that your questions can still be answered. Um, you can directly chat the questions over to our office staff, who will then forward the questions over and place them in our right panel. Um, you can also feel free to email questions over to our email, and I'm just going to say that that's uh, at info at yulinu.org, and I'm going to spell it for you. It's info, I-N-F-O, at Y-U-H-L-I-N-E-N-I-O-U dot O-R-G. And again, that's info at yulinu.org, so my full name dot O-R-G. And so please leave your email and or your phone number uh, so that we can follow up with your questions in case we don't get to them today. We're gonna try to get to everything, of course, but as you know, we are already a very long program and we are also very crunched in time. Um, in the last week of March, I just wanted to let folks know that we gathered as state legislators to vote on all of the proposed budget bills. The are uh, all of the bills that, there's seven in total, that have the content of our entire state's budget in them. Um, there are some wins in this budget. Uh, the 2020-21 uh, budget uh, includes a measure that authorizes, for example, the use of e-bikes. And um, the use of e-bikes right now is very, very crucial due to folks um, being uh, you know, needing our essential workers who are delivery workers to be able to deliver food. Um, the use of e-bikes is incredibly important for our delivery workers who now find themselves on the front line of this pandemic. And um, we also did things like banning fracking and the use of uh, polystyrene single use containers, um, both of which are devastating to our environment. Um, we also passed a bill that will require annual sick leave policies for all private sector employees. Um, you know, there's a couple of good things like that in our bill, but overall, I just wanted to note that um, our budget was not optimal and not ideal. Um, I am very sad, very angry, and very frustrated when I look at the past budget bills. Um, the budget will leave many people, many programs, and many policies that we all agree are vital for our state, uh, you know, rather unfunded and unable to fulfill our goals. Um, as as legislators, we were left with very little choice but to vote for what we all know is a flawed budget despite our misgivings and despite the fact that it further erodes the balance of power that should exist between the legislative and executive branches. Some of us in this room voted yes, some of us in this room voted no. I was a no vote, um, but I know that it is a very tough spot to be in um, because of the way that uh, the budget is framed and the budget was uh, written. And so um, I wanted to uh, also talk about how I believe that we had an opportunity in this budget to make a bold shift to a state spending plan that truly values all people and embraces a future in which we are actively moving to do things like reduce poverty, build stronger infrastructure, expand housing and transit, to honor our health workers, and also to 
our teachers and our first responders and to create good jobs across our state while preparing for future challenges. We had that opportunity and we are letting it pass us by in favor of a budget that allows New York to basically barely get by, but little more. Um, today, we want to discuss with our amazing panelists what these budget changes mean for you, our community, and what we need to fight for going forward. And I just want to go through um, and say thank you to all of the panelists again. And I also wanted to give an opportunity for our uh, electeds who are joining us on this call to say hello and to also be able to um, tell us a little bit about their thoughts on the budget and also a little bit about what they're uh, working on during the pandemic right now. So first I want to um, really, really, I want, sorry, that was my partner. I wanted to very quickly say um, a huge welcome to our amazing Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Gail? Well, thank you very much, Assembly Member. I do miss your wonderful uh, events that take place. We sit on stools and we then go and have great discussions um, at Educational Alliance and it, it's really missed. I don't miss everything. But I do miss those, and because they're very special, both for the women, the one you did on women, and for the, the oh, specific topic. So, but anyway, we'll learn a lot today, and that's a little bit what I want to talk about for a minute, which is the future. And I think, as a Manhattanites and elected officials, we should be doing two things, and I'm going to work on it with the community boards and Manhattanites, which is the 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 mayor has a group of people. I've seen the list. I'm sure you have also who are the what's going to happen in the future, people. And then the governor has a list, some of whom are upstaters and some of whom are New Yorkers. And I think as a group, we should be putting together, I've already started what we want for the borough of Manhattan. And there are uh, so we're different. And so I'm working on that. I'd love to have your input. But one of them is just even things like testing sites. The only one on the Lower East Side that's a public, I think, is Gouverneur. And we need to be, we need more testing sites in the borough of Manhattan. Um, we also need to think about, you know, what does it look like for the future for the restaurants and for the bars and so on, because we have so many of them. And my understanding from the governor, and you know better than I, is it's going to be very industry based, you know, what does the uh, hospitality alliance, restaurant association, NYC and company, etc. So what do they think should be happening? But I think the community boards and local officials should also be thinking about that. I've been talking with Steve Levin, whom I adore as a uh, council member, about there are some groups doing some really interesting work in Massachusetts and California in terms of surveillance that doesn't cross the line around civil liberties and HIPAA issues, which are really important. And we can talk more about that but they really are able to say where there are issues and where there are not using fascinating data in a positive way. So that's something to think about for the future. And then the schools. I've been on the phone because we appoint some of the CEC members, as you probably know. So we've been virtually meeting with them on a regular basis. Um, we appoint two on every CEC. And I think you know some of the issues, but um, what is it going to look like in September? What do the CECs and the parents want it to look like in September? What do we want it to look like in September? And all those kinds of issues, I think they need to come up more and more because um, that's what we're going to be dealing with. So without getting into all the specifics, um, you know, off the call, we need to have more discussion about what is the future. Those are just some of the things that I've been thinking about and there are many, many more. But in terms of working, on topics, obviously, uh, we've been we were able to convince the mayor, and I thank him, thank him, in particular, uh, Kathleen Garcia, to get the uh, fresh direct contract uh, to exist because they were volunteered before. So uh, from the top of Manhattan to the bottom of Manhattan, we've been going to the NYCHA developments on the Lower East Side. As Harvey knows, it's on Friday, and that's been very successful because it's 500. Uh, packets of food, and we've been trying to distribute them within the community to the different NYCHAs. Um, I think the seniors and food, just not just NYCHA, is better. Catherine Garcia has finally gotten the 311, I think, not always the best quality of food, but at least you don't have to call every two days. The seniors were frustrated beyond belief. I was worried, you were worried. 
Um, so it looks like if you're on the list, having called 311 and asked for the food line, you do get food. Finally, last week, every senior center got the list of who's on their list and who's not, because they really didn't know. They'd added people doing grab and grow. They didn't have the list. And most of the senior centers have been trained on the platform that the city is using, and they have found it to be easy to use and responsive. So let's hope that that helps. It was really challenging, to put it mildly. Um, I think we're all trying to get masks to people. We did get uh, 50,000 on Friday, and we distributed about 50,000 around the borough. I know uh, Vanessa uh, Diaz from our office, who I think you know, did a lot of distributing around the Lower East Side. And the, the need is tremendous. Um, I know, for instance, I went yesterday, the mayor, to his credit, said, we're going to give out masks in parks. And I think they did some on Catherine Street this morning. But I went to Central Park yesterday just to see how it would work, because that was their first stop. And uh, it was a 10 o'clock to 12 noon time frame for the PEP, the PEP officers, to give them out. And they were gone by 10.30 or 10.45. Um, so everybody needs masks just because we're supposed to wear them. People are really needing a mask. So, and they're not so easy to find. So we just need to keep doing that. I know that we're getting more on Monday and we'll be in touch if anybody uh, needs more, we're getting more on Monday. Um, nursing homes. So obviously we read about them. I think I did say to the mayor, you know, five weeks ago, nursing homes, because I was getting calls and it's a real one of those state city issues and it's they fall in between the cracks so we all know there are some like isabella which i we're all very fond of that nursing home so it's very challenging to hear the stories i don't you know i've heard the story from the nursing home isabella i've heard the story from uh relatives and i've heard the story from the governor and the mayor so it's uh in people died and that's the worst part and i know um I've been working with Kohler on Roosevelt Island, and obviously we all know Gouverneur, and I'm sure you know others. But I think, again, long term, we need a whole lot of work with the nursing homes. Um, people are scared to death to go in. They don't know the communication is challenging, and sometimes the ownership is challenging. So you know that from Rivington, it, loving it in the past, not sure what's next. So I think that's a topic to uh, pay attention to in the future. Um, the stores, we all know uh, PPP issues. SBS, the city has been trying. Um, I think that it's a, the banks who have been a challenge. My understanding from uh, your congresswoman and uh, Congressman Espiat and the feds in general, and Congressman Nadler too, that there's gonna be a fifth stimulus. And some of these bank issues were tried to be dealt with. Um, but I can tell you just from neighbors and friends who own businesses, no question, but to go to a smaller bank was a ticket as opposed to working with a large bank. I mean, almost exclusively because who knows who the big banks were working with, but not the small businesses for sure. So we need to work. I, I worry so much when I hear something like 50% of the small businesses aren't gonna make it and a third of the nonprofits aren't gonna make it. And the arts organization, we've been working with a lot and they even have more challenges because if, if there's no box office, the virtual is great, but it doesn't bring in a lot of money. So we have to think really creatively about the arts. Um, you know more about housing than I do, but I certainly know we've been supporting zero increase. Uh, we wrote a letter, I think, with others of Red Guidelines Board. And certainly, it's great to have a moratorium, but God help us when the rent is due. So I know I happen to support, I didn't even tell him in advance, Senator Kavanaugh's bill. And um, there's money. People need money. Very, very finally, I just want to mention on Chinatown, as you know, the REDC, the state, the state officials know this, the states divide up into 10 regions. Uh, we're in a region in the five boroughs, and every year $10 million for commercial is given out in a uh, region. And in the past, the Bronx got it, Brooklyn got it, Staten Island got it, and Queens got it. We should get it. And so I'm advocating that Chinatown get it, and we're working to make that happen. So I just want to bring that up. And um, thank you very much. I will just, uh, as you know, as I said earlier, people asking me about weddings and I understand the city clerk is gonna be ready 
at the end of this week to have the paperwork so it's 100% virtual. And then I'm sure you can Zoom it and the rest is history. Thank you very much. Oh, there we, there we go. Sorry. They said, thank you so much, Gail. Um, I just wanted to, uh, speaking of Senator Kavanaugh, bring up Senator Kavanaugh to talk a little bit about, um, you know, his thoughts on the budget and um, also what uh, is going on in the district on his end for uh, the COVID response. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Eileen. Uh, and uh, I echo uh, Gail Brewer's sentiments. Your uh, town hall, your in-person town hall meetings really had become a wonderful fixture of our community um, and you know, a great opportunity for it to get together um, and hear from each other and learn what's going on and all of your wonderful work. Um, this is you know, a great substitute. Uh, I think it's going to lack the uh, you know, food from various uh, restaurants in the neighborhood that we usually enjoy sometimes while the speaking is going on and sometimes after, but uh, really again, appreciate the opportunity to be here and your role convening this and your great leadership in our community and in uh, your work in Albany. Um, I, I wanna, so uh, Gail Brewer covered a lot of uh, what's been going on on the ground uh, throughout Manhattan and certainly um, all of those issues are, uh, you know, primary concerns in our community. Um, we've been working very closely with uh, Yulene's office and all of our colleagues uh, to make sure that the, all of these systems that we had to stand up very rapidly are in place and are improving day by day. So everything from uh, making sure uh, seniors who previously relied on food uh, in person at senior centers got that system transitioned to a sort of a distribution system, uh, making sure also food at the schools has been available. Uh, and, you know, uh, in addition to the direct deliveries, um, that Gail Burr was talking about. Um, uh, an issue that uh, is really a state issue, it's a, it's a distribution of both state and federal funds uh, that I know was very, very difficult initially and still continues to be difficult has been the uh, implementation of the enhanced unemployment benefits uh, that people are supposed to be receiving. Um, that system was clearly not designed uh, to take the volume of people who came all at once seeking benefits as the economy shut down very rapidly. Um, we've worked very hard to improve that to work with the State Department of Labor and push for uh, elimination of barriers and moving that system to uh, a system that can get take the application without people spending hours and hours on the phone. Um, uh, on hold and uh, make sure the benefits are flowing. Um, it's still not, it's still a work in progress. Our offices, uh, if you are having a particular problem, can contact the DOL directly and try to get that addressed. So please do contact us and I'll give my contact information at the end or obviously uh, Eulene's office uh, can be very helpful as well. On the budget, I, I you know, you, Eulene, you said it well, it was a very difficult budget. Um, as we know, the, the budget is ultimately a product of something the governor proposes to the legislature. There's negotiation about what that's gonna look like. At the end of the day, the legislature has to do an up or down vote when the clock runs out and the negotiation is over. Um, I share the concern about um, many of the uh, cuts and uh, the uh, things that were omitted from that budget. Um, we, and we're gonna, we're gonna continue that story. It's gonna be a continuing challenge. One of the things that was, uh, contemplated in that budget is a process by which throughout the year there'll be a reassessment which will begin by the governor proposing um, changes to the budget, probably uh, likely mostly cuts to the budget um, as the economic emergency continues and as tax revenues continue to decline. So uh, the first of those, um, the first round of that is actually uh, upon us. Uh, it, it was supposed to be no earlier than uh, May 1st, which was Friday. Uh, so, and the governor has signaled that there'll be a set of proposals to reduce spending in certain areas will be coming. Uh, we will be monitoring that very closely. And the provision says that if the legislature uh, can come up with a better plan, um, we can substitute that for anything the governor is going to propose. But that's going to be very challenging. And so people should pay attention to that. Uh, the budget process usually ends on April 1st, and then we come back next year. But this is going to be an ongoing struggle in New York. Um, one issue that was not really addressed, and Gail Brewer alluded to it just a moment ago, is this question of housing and support for people who can't pay their rent, and also people who can't pay mortgages uh, during the course of the crisis because they've lost uh, income. So as the state budget was passing, 
There was also this allocation of mo some money in the federal budget through the CARES Act for housing uh, expenditures. Um, and it was a significant amount of money. It would be actually, in normal circumstances, getting hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government would, consider, would be considered a great uh, boon, a very large amount of money. Um, it's relatively, it's small relative to the enormous uh, challenge we have before us uh, with you know, thousands, really tens of thousands of, of tenants unable to pay, and also people having trouble with their mortgages. Um, we have proposed, uh, there are uh, several different approaches to this. I know uh, some uh, people, including Yulene, uh, have proposed uh, a, a cancellation of rent. Um, we've been working on a proposal that would permit uh the government to pay the rent for people uh and it so we're developing a program at the state level so there's a clear understanding of who's whose rent would get paid and how it would get paid and who would be eligible uh, with the goal of avoiding that thing that happened with unemployment where the money came and then we had to begin to figure out how to work out you know what the payment would look like um, and how it would be administered so we're trying to work out those details now in negotiation over a piece of legislation uh, and we've gotten broad support for that the critical thing, though, is that the only entity that has the money necessary to cover those costs at this point is the federal government. The city and the state budgets must be balanced by law. We don't have the kind of credit of the federal government that would be necessary to run large deficits. The federal government has already decided uh, to allocate $2.7 trillion uh, to address uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And as has already been noted, there's an expectation of another round of stimulus. The message need to be said over and over again, loudly and clearly, that the federal government needs to step up on and cover the real cost of housing to make sure tenants have the resources to pay their rent, to make sure landlords have the resources to maintain their buildings and pay their property taxes that are going to become going to be critical to the city government in providing services, and to pay. Uh, their, their own mortgages and their uh, employees' uh, uh, wages and benefits. Um, and so uh, our several hundred of us have written to Congress at local elected officials around the state, uh, as well as advocate, advocacy organizations, calling for a $100 billion federal allocation nationwide, of which New York would get $10 billion. Uh, that, that was our ask. Um, and several members of our congressional delegation have expressed support for that, but we know it's going to take a huge push. So please, as you're talking, we, we're getting contacts from our uh, constituents. Uh, I'm sure you lean is and, and I am in the state Senate and, and city council members and Gail Brewer. Please make sure you're including advocacy. If you're contacting elected officials, contact your federal officials as well. Your, your U.S. senators and your Congress members and ask them to make sure that is a priority. Uh, just two other briefly on housing issues, on uh, mortgages, uh, homeowner mortgages. Uh, we have a piece of legislation that would address that to the extent we can at the state level. Uh, it basically takes, there's currently a forbearance period uh, during which the bank is not permitted to collect your mortgage uh, payments or take any adverse action against you if you can't pay. Uh, the, the bill we have would extend that period uh, for to a six month uh, forbearance. It's currently uh, three months with a possibility of an additional six month extension after that. And it would take all of the payments that are due during that period, which are currently going to come due right at the end of the period and it would move it basically to the end of the mortgage so if you have a mortgage until 2030 until january 2030 it would uh it would extend that mortgage to july of 2030 or uh january of 2031 so that you you're basically making those payments at the same pace you're making them now but many years from now we believe that would uh leave people more or less such that their mortgage effectively didn't um impose any burden on them during this crisis. Uh, so again, that is a bill that we have the authority in New York to do with state, with mortgages that are backed by state banks, or we believe also that are carried or administered by state, by mortgage service companies in New York. There are many mortgages that are instead administered by interstate banks or by the federal government. We believe the federal government has the authority to do the same thing as that, uh, that we're doing at the state level. With, with respect to federal mortgages. So we've worked with uh, Congress uh, member Kathleen Rice the day we introduced our bill. 
uh, she uh, committed to introduce a comparable piece of legislation at the, at the federal level. She's a caucus member from Long Island. Uh, so again, we hope that through those tools, we can make the uh, mortgage situation for homeowners uh, better. Just one more brief thing on housing homelessness. Um, it's become, people have become more aware than ever before of the crisis that is homelessness in New York. As much as we understood uh, it was a terrible tragedy that so many people were living in public spaces and living in shelters uh, and, and at numbers that are just, you know, outrageous, even in normal times. When you're dealing with a contagious disease that is a pandemic, it is especially critical that people are not uh, forced to live in public spaces or live in congregate settings where they can't maintain the kind of distance that we're all talking about uh, as a critical part of our response to this. So. Uh, a key part of our housing strategy needs to be providing much more affordable permanent housing for people and also increasing the capacity of the shelter system to uh, get people out of congregate settings, get people off the street. So we're working on that as well. And that should be part of the funding that uh, the federal government provides. Again, sorry to go on for a while, uh, but again, it's a great, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And um, I look forward to the rest of the program today. And thank you so much again, Eileen, for all your work and your uh, collaboration on so many of these things. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I wanted to call my next, my next speaker, which is actually my other senator, um, Brad Hoylman, who's working on a lot of things as well. Brad? Yeah, let me share. Um, but I uh, wanted to say hello to my colleagues and uh, all of our shared constituents, Yulene. Uh, and thank you, you know, I have to say, you really, um, you really are a standout in the assembly and I know Harvey agrees. You're, um, the way you are able to focus on an issue uh, as we've seen during this budget process and, you know, get truth to power encapsulated in a um, policy, initiative um, is really inspiring. So I just really want to thank you for our partnership and everything you're doing for your district. You've been particularly, um, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, courageous uh, even before COVID-19 even like landed on our shores. We saw that um, uh, your community uh, had to be outspoken and uh, I'm very grateful for everything you've done. So. Um, I just want to share in uh, Senator Kavanaugh's concern about uh, housing and tenants' rights and wanted to thank you again, Eulene, for your cancel rent legislation. Uh, I, there's no more important issue right now that I'm hearing from my constituents than their, besides their health, it's their economic health. And so many, uh, and I know my colleagues agree, so many of our constituents are calling us on a daily basis. We become unemployment insurance, you know, uh, liaisons, whether we wanted to or not. That's, that's kind of like our full-time job. And I encourage all of our constituents to continue to call our offices about unemployment insurance. We can take uh, a case and try to usher it through to fruition. That's, that's our job. And I know that Caroline Wexelbaum, who I think is on the line with me, my colleague, has been doing that so uh, effectively. M one of my former staffers, David Kruger, who I think some folks know, uh, bad news is he left my office a few months ago. Good news is he landed up in the Department of Labor. So he, uh, he's able to be kind of our insider uh, in my office to help usher these cases through. So I wanted to encourage people to do that. And on the cancel rent movement, um, you know, <laughs> I think Senator Gianaris, your co-sponsor, said it best, which is whether there was a rent strike or not, uh, effectively, um, it exists because we know that our um, many of our constituents just don't have the money to pay their rent. Right? And they, you know, so many of them are uh, not well, their family members are ill, um, they're battling illness, they're homeschooling, they've lost their jobs. I mean, it is, it is a perfect storm of of proportions uh, none of us could have ever expected. That's why I appreciate Senator Kavanaugh's efforts and your efforts. Um, a bill that I've introduced with Senator Kruger, uh, which I think fits into both of the legislative strategies that you heard outlined, would um, give tenants, and whether they're commercial or residential, 
uh, six months after the state of emergency is declared ended to get healthy, get back up on their feet, uh, get their jobs back in place, and then start paying rent and give them eviction protections all the way through that period. As you know, the governor's eviction moratorium ends on June 18th. My concern and Senator Kruger's concern uh, is that landlords could be filing eviction proceedings as soon as the courts open up. And on June 19th, you could see a whole slew of evictions across the, across the city. So thanks to, to Ellen for helping us craft this legislation uh, that I think we want to try to build into whatever um, proposals we pass back in Albany when we start resuming our virtual legislation. Um, so want to want to thank you uh, for your efforts, uh, Ellen. And then, um, you know, we still have so many other issues um, that uh, that we have to pursue simultaneously. I'm very concerned about the, the inaccuracy of the antibody tests that are currently flooding the market and the fact that so many New Yorkers now have this false assurance that they've been exposed to COVID-19, yet the reality shows that some of these tests are 16, give 16% 16 false positives. Uh, I was, you know, I took a walk last night, I'm sure a lot of you did, and you saw people congregating on street corners with their face masks down and, you know, sipping their, their, their rosé out, uh, out of thermos bottles. Uh, it's kind of nice to see that public spirit, but it seems very risky, um, given that, you know, close to 300 people died yesterday. Um, and uh, this, you know, this crisis is, uh, while we're going down uh, the curve, uh, like the governor just said this morning, the risk uh, remains very high. So we still have to continue our social distancing and make certain that people are getting accurate tests. And clearly uh, the antibody tests have shown uh, some concerns. The only tests that I think that public health officials are relying on truly at this point are the diagnostic swab tests where you actually know if you're COVID uh, positive or not. That said, um, you know, I'm you know, um, going to continue to work with uh, all of my colleagues on this line and making sure that people get the supplies they need, whether it be food or sanitizer. Um, we've all been working together extremely well um, in Manhattan. I just want to thank my colleagues again for you know, whether it's food pantries that, that Harvey uh, has helped organize with Carlina Rivera's office. Um, we're getting hand sanitizers, you know, that were, you know, you lean, that we're all trying to uh, uh, organize and Senator Kavanaugh to our, to our public housing uh, and ensuring that, um, you know, we check in on our seniors and vulnerable people. It's been a wonderful group effort. I think it, you know, while this is a dreadful time for us, it has shown the best of our communities uh, in many respects. And um, uh, Eileen, I know this is a budget conversation and I think that, you know, what you know as well as I do hanging over our heads right now are $10 billion worth of proposed cuts um, that the governor has threatened. Uh, if, it is a, if it is a strategy to get more federal money, uh, I commend him for that because I, as Senator Kavanaugh said, we can't do this without the feds. Um, I disagree with Senator Kavanaugh the, to the extent that whether the state can borrow, you know, the state has already borrowed and we continue to borrow. Um, and if we need to clarify our borrowing abilities, we should do that. But I do agree with him that we shouldn't borrow until we know what we're getting from the feds. Um, and that fight has to continue with um, our Congress members. Um, and ensure that they have the backing of everyone here on this line. Um, but, um, you know, so when we go back, Eileen, um, we got to figure out additional revenue. Uh, if the feds aren't giving it to us, how are we going to get it? And, you know, um, is it, you know, there's a lot of great proposals out there. Um, I, I, I've introduced some. Um, I think, you know, um, uh, whether it's uh, the, the Harvey's mezzanine tax, uh, which is, I think, is a really creative solution. Uh, whether it is, you know, the personal income tax that, you know, if you want to tax rich people, that's the most efficient way to do it. Uh, whether it's looking at uh, some taxes that, that um, New York has, um, you know, not collected well, 
over over the last uh, 10 to 15 years or tax cuts that we've instituted. You know, I think everything like Andre Stewart Cousins said has to be on the table. So uh, that's going to be, I think, one of our biggest responsibilities. I think the biggest mistake would be, Eileen, is if we cut during a recession. I think that's been shown to to double down on um, the uh, you know uh, economic uncertainty and and actually create not only does it create greater hardships for the most vulnerable, but it slows recovery. Um, we need a stimulus package. Uh, we need money uh, at every level. The state cannot be responsible for cuts to you know healthcare, schools, seniors, homeless. Uh, uh, it's just, it's immoral and, and effective. So I join you, Eileen, in the call for greater revenue. Uh, I know my colleagues are in lockstep on that point. How we get there is going to be, you know, um, it's going to be our sh shared fight. Uh, but I look forward to continue partnership in that regard. I know that um, we'll have great support from our constituents because They've seen, as we see, um, and as the calls we get and the contact we make with our constituents, um, our public is hurting and we need to help them out. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, as we all know, and as this uh, pandemic has shown us, you know, we are very interconnected. Um, we might not be on the same boats, uh, as a lot of people say, you know, oh, we're all on the same boats. Like, actually, no, some people have yachts and other people have dinghies and maybe a floaty device that has a hole in it. Like, I don't know. But I do think that, um, you know, we all are interconnected, though. And um, helping your neighbor is helping yourself right now. And also helping um, each other is helping uh, all of us uh, get through this. So thank you so much for your thank wide you. work. Oh, let me just wait. May one more. Thank you to the borough president for getting so much food to our constituents. I mean, thank you. It's so just much. been it's li it's life saving, and uh, I'm just so grateful that I hear reports from seniors who have gotten you know fresh pantry deliveries because of her efforts. So thank you, borough president. Yes, thank you, Gail, for all of the work you've been doing, uh, making sure that our uh, districts have the supplies that it needs and the PPEs and the, um, you know, and the food that we've been uh, desperately needing. So I wanted to really uh, focus on your efforts there for a second and say thank you, because we can't, we really can't um, do the things that we're doing now without your help as well on that up front. Um, I also wanted to say uh, hello to my neighbor, to the east north i guess northeast <laughs> and i just wanted to say that um he's been an incredible partner in all of this and um you know we uh we fought together on um on on raising revenue and uh making sure that we can get the things that we wanted in the budget unfortunately um you know we didn't get what we wanted for NYCHA, for Medicaid, for um, education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, he was also a partner in uh, voting no on the budget this year. So Harvey Epstein. Thank you, Yulene, and really want to thank you for your leadership and really good to hear from Brad and Brian and Gail. And you know, we, as you, we do such a good job here in the East Side, Lower East Side, working together. We just are a really strong team. Just want to raise a couple of things if I can. Just what information things for people who are on here that we're giving away masks tomorrow at Sixth Street in the FDR with the mayor's office at 10 a.m. If people want to come over, give away free masks. Like Gail mentioned that also. With all the offices here, uh, the Uline, my office, with Brad, Brian, Gail, there's food delivery. If you need food, reach out to our office, Uline's office, Brad, Brian, Gail, Vision Urbana, Henry Street. Your great community partners are doing a lot of this food delivery. So together, if you do need food, and there's a lot of great fresh food that's going out, you should you should reach out to us. Um, you know, those nights get out these big jugs of hand sanitizer. Unfortunately, it's hard to, to do anything with big jugs. So we're trying to work on getting it accessible for people. So you can reach out to us around, you know, hopefully have little bottles that will be in place for folks in the near future. Uh, also, there's been a lot of testing going on. We haven't gotten a night to site down by us yet for to doing testing. There's been some of that happening in the Bronx. I've been told, at least from our speaker, Eulene, that we'll be getting some sites 
some testing done by us at some NYCHA developments. I don't know, I heard that at the end of last week and hopefully that'll be happening soon. We do have Gouvenier, by the way. Gouvenier is doing testing right, right. now. Yeah, okay. but they're gonna do, they're gonna go on site at NYCHA development like they did in the, sorry, in the Bronx since we have a, yeah, such a high a, supply of NYCHA. There's nothing down here. There, there is a Gouvenier as a site and then we also are placing two more sites within NYCHA complex. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, so we've heard from students, you know, CUNY, SUNY, about remote learning and some of the problems they're having there. Same thing with uh, problems on education if you're hearing. If you have a problem, if you're a public school parent or you're a student at CUNY or SUNY, you should reach out because we're trying to manage that. Brad mentioned the unemployment benefits and the crisis that are going on. It's really outrageous. Uh, as two last things, I just want to mention there was a recent uh, a police um, assault on some constituents of mine that happened last night in the Lower East Side. We had called on the commissioner to investigate that right away. It's, it's really disturbing the videos that we've seen at this point of, of the violence that was perpetrated against some people in our community. It is, you know, especially in a pandemic when you're saying that they, didn't, they were arresting people for not social distancing and you can look at Central Park, the idea that someone's sitting on a, on a stoop on, on Avenue D and 9th Street um, is social distancing and it deserves that kind of physical assault when you see lots of white people in Central Park not even wearing masks and not social distancing. It's, it's, it's really awful and we, we've called on the commissioner and the mayor to do a full investigation and we do need the body camera. And just the last thing I'll say is just around the budget. Uh, and <clears throat> As Eileen mentioned, it was a tough budget. We fought hard against a lot of things. The changes in bail were, were awful, especially in a pandemic. The idea we're adding categories to crimes in bail, zero sense. That we didn't engage in any level of budget justice in an economic downturn, where millionaires and billionaires are doing just fine. We've seen reports of them even doing better. The top 10 millionaires, billionaires in New York have gotten raised revenue, more money coming to their pockets, not less. 30 million people getting unemployment. The idea that one or two percent increase in their tax basis on the city and state level, they wouldn't even feel it because they're getting so much more money. And we didn't stand up this year for New Yorkers. Now we're going to have a shot to do it three more times this year because the governor is going to propose three uh, revisions of the budget. And each quarter he's going to propose cuts and we're going to have to propose new revenue. So we're going to need your support here, both in the assembly and the Senate side to stand up and say, the only answer has to be new revenue. I get that the federal government has to come in and provide support and we need that desperately, but New York needs to stand strong as well. We need to stand strong, whether it's like Brad mentioned, the mezzanine tax, we're doing his Pieter Ter tax. You know, Eulene's got amazing revenues or bills that we want to talk about. All of those things have to happen and we need to happen now because the idea that we're gonna cut from Medicare and Medicaid, that we're gonna cut our health and hospitals, we're not going to provide any resources for public housing. We're going to cut our school aid. We're going to cut services for people with disabilities time and time again. That can't be the answer, especially in a pandemic, especially as a, uh, the budget collapses. We can't do it. And the way to do it is to really help people to cancel rent and put a hardship fund available for, for, for landlords if they need it, to protect the commercial storefronts. We have plans to do it. And I think in the next week or so, we'll be holding hearings. There was an announcement at a joint Senate and assembly hearing around potential hearings. And I plan to be there. And I know my colleagues will be there to push the things we care about because we have to cancel rent. We have to protect our small business and we have to fight for a better budget. And I stand in line with you and Yulene, thank you for what you do. Thank you for being such a good friend and a colleague. And I look forward to your virtual town hall. We're all getting used to these now. So I'm sure it'll be fabulous. Thank you so much, Harvey. Um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you again to all of our elected officials who are here. Um, I had gotten some messages from Carlina on things that she wanted us to plug in. Um, she unfortunately couldn't be here today and I'll plug them in uh, as we are going through our panels as well. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, right now my district is going through a lot. You know, the things that Gail had just mentioned about small businesses is such a huge uh, concern for us um, because uh, my district, um, and especially in Chinatown, we started to feel the effects uh, much earlier than anybody else because of some of the racism that was going on, the xenophobia. And, um, you know, it was very hard to, um, 
you know, very hard to uh, take that up to Albany and have no response. And it was really hard to um, hear from folks that, um, you know, oh, now that we're all shut down, we have these things that we're going through. Well, actually, um, there's a lot of things that were happening um, before. And, uh, and, and, and this is why, you know, when I, when I talked about um, the budget um, on the floor, I really wanted people to know that these are choices that we're making. These are really clearly choices that we're making. Um, and, and I wanted to echo what Brad was saying, that, you know, when we are choosing to um, take as the government a little bit of the blow a little bit harder to us um it makes it so that we're not suffering for decades to come um for our people right and i think that like i i think that that these are choices that we have to be very conscientious about because um if we are if we're not raising revenue if we're not um making it so that our budget is the thing that takes the hit and not the people. Recovery will be much harder. And I think that we have to uh, really be conscientious as we make these decisions going forward. Um, and I, as we are talking about the budget, I hope that people can understand how dire some of these things are as we speak, because when we are, when we are looking at each piece, and how the trickle down effects will affect people. Um, we're gonna have our panelists kind of tell us a little bit about what's going on on the front lines. And then also, um, you know, all of our elected friends here, um, please stay on and please, um, you know, chime in when you need to about the issues that, you know, have been affecting your district. I think that that's really, really important. Um, and I hope that we can um, talk a little bit about each of the pieces uh, and, and in the era of, now, right? What what the what the budget was when we passed it, and then also what the trickle down effect has been now, and what these uh, future um, stop gaps can be to make sure that the um, that the uh, trickle down domino effect isn't continuing. And so we can we uh, after all we can suggest answers and we can suggest uh, policy proposals and things, you know, as we are working right now still to the governor, um, but. You know, of course, we all have um, we all have uh, our our roles to play here as well to make sure that our uh, governor is hearing what we are proposing and suggesting, uh, and and what what is coming from our constituents and what is coming from their concerns as well. So um, I just wanted to run through, and I, and I think my staff is on here as well. So I just wanted to run through. Um, some of the things that happened in this year's budget. And as Brad had mentioned, and Brian has mentioned, there are $10 billion more worth of cuts being proposed on top of what was proposed already. And so I'm going to go through what our budget says, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the things that were also proposed. Um, and if, uh, Lawrence, if you can make sure that folks um, have our budget cheat sheet. A lot of folks know I'm very famous for my budget cheat sheets. We put them together um, with uh, a lot of, effort. It takes us a long time to really be able to put it together, hours and hours of work. And um, I want to thank my staff for being so diligent about um, reading each line and putting together this budget cheat sheet. So um, it, you know, please print it out if you want, um, keep it with you, open it up on your on your screen right now so that you have it with you. Um, and, you know, there's a it's, it's inside of our Google Drive that we've opened up to folks to be able to get. So please view it, please take it um, and, 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 you know, use it, you know, feel free to take pieces of it and use it in your discussions with folks and also in, um, in, in, in advocating for the issues that you care about. So um, I just wanted to go through really quickly before we start our panels. Um, for education, this year's budget includes $27.9 billion for education for the fiscal year of 2020 to 2021. That is only a 0.3% increase over the previous year, which means that it does not account for inflation and in fact is much below it, um, but is still short of the $4 billion also of what the state needs for a truly equitable education system. We know that we have been owed uh, a lot of money for a very long time. Our district has the largest income disparity in the state and our schools reflect that disparity. Our schools in Lower Manhattan alone are owed over $44.3 million in education dollars and full, uh, fully funding our public schools is incredibly necessary for our community, especially now as students um, have missed 
large portions of the school um, and when people are not even given uh, laptops uh, in a timely fashion or might not have parents to get them for them um, or might uh, be homeless and in a shelter and cannot access the internet. And so, um, you know, public schools should give our students the resources that they most need, but they are unable to do that if we do not even have the proper funding. I want to I want to note that very loudly because it's not that they're not trying; it's that we don't have um, a lot of the funding that we need to be able to access um, the, the the things that we need to. This year's budget did not include the dollars that we need for truly equitable education for all of our students. Um, moving on to housing, this year's budget includes no additional NYCHA funding, but uh, instead reallocates the $350 million meant for infrastructure upgrades that we won that was allocated in previous years. I believe that this is very unacceptable. And in our district, 30% of our constituents live in public housing. And the number one issue that our constituents bring to our office is related to public housing. NYCHA's um, failing uh, you know, infrastructure is estimated to need $31.8 billion over the next five years, yet state money uh, allocated in previous years to repair and upgrade NYCHA's aging infrastructure is now being redirected instead um, for uh, being distributed for their original purpose. Um, I think that this is a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, as you know, I was the person who carried the letter for um, NYCHA funding for the last uh, four years. And you know, this year we got extremely close. Um, Ellen can tell you a little bit about it, but we got extremely, extremely, extremely close to getting allocations for the next five years um, for NYCHA. But unfortunately, unfortunately, um, we then fell into this pandemic and uh, it gave the government the excuse I think, to not fund public housing the way that it needs to be. And especially when during a time when housing is actually health care. This is a, this is a, a very dire and um, cruel neglect. And I think that this budget is insufficient to meet the vital funding needs for our housing system. And we have to continue to fight for the housing revenue and funding that we need to solve our crisis in our city. Public housing is affordable housing. And it is one of the last uh, real affordable housing that we have here in our state, in our city, and we need to make sure to protect it. It is extremely important that protecting Lower Manhattan from climate change is a priority. Um, my district was obviously hit the hardest by Sandy. And at this point, there's no doubt that there will be another severe weather event like Superstorm Sandy. And the question is when it will happen. We need to ensure that Lower Manhattan and New York State as a whole is as prepared as possible. The budget bans the use of polystyrene aka styrofoam uh, food containers and institutes a permanent ban on uh, hydro, uh, hydraulic fracking. And these are wins for our community and working towards a better environment, but this year's budget allows for New York State also to issue bonds in an aggregate of $3 billion towards the Restore Mother Nature Act, which is dedicated towards climate change mitigation, environmental restoration and conservation and resiliency infrastructure. This bond is something that's very, very crucial, but we believe that the amount could have been a lot more. Um, we feel like this bond is something that is long overdue and we need to make sure that we are uh, also continuing to support it. This budget also allows municipalities to legalize electronic bikes and scooters. Delivery workers, many of whom live in our district and who are on the front lines of the pandemic every day, depend on e-bikes to make a living. And at our city level, we have been cruelly uh, fining them, um, but uh, we believe that this should not be criminalized or fined when they are just trying to achieve a, a living. And I am glad that the state has taken the step to uh, allow eco-friendly alternatives to cars, but I am disappointed about um, the legalization of e-scooters, which are insufficiently regulated and pose accessibility issues to our seniors and the disabled. And I have been um, included, and, and they have been included without uh, a lot of deliberation. Um, this is not something that is, uh, you know, used for delivery <laughs> and is not something that um, has been um, uh, even seen as a real alternative for car usage the way that e-bikes are. Uh, for the MTA, the budget also provides a dedicated funding stream towards the $54.8 billion in financing support needed for the 2020-2024 capital plan. Our district has some of the worst performing lines, some of the most inaccessible subway entrances, severe congestion, and poorly protected bike lanes. With organizational sh shuffles in the MTA, it is vital that we work to ensure our community's needs are heard. And so we will be hearing a lot of, about that from our transportation uh, panel as well. This year's budget rollbacks um, 
uh, th this year's budget rolls back uh, hard fought criminal justice reforms by extending. Time, but there will also never be a time to give into the racially motivated fear based attempts to roll back bail reform and go back to a system which worked against our communities and led to an inequitable criminal justice system in the first place. As we all have known for a very long time that there should not be two criminal justice systems, one for the rich and one for the poor. And we should make sure that um, that our criminal justice system is actually equal for everyone. And I wanted to say that I'm proud to have st stood up with my colleagues against bail reform rollbacks and um, I will continue to fight for more equitable um, systems because we all know that some systems it within actually most of the systems within our government uh, are designed to uh, hurt certain communities and help others. Finally this year the state's uh, Medicaid redesign plan cuts 400 million dollars to hospital spending but increases overall medical uh, Medicaid spending by 500 million 3% more than the previous year. The Medicaid redesign plan also makes modifications to the 300 million dollars of restored funds from the previous fiscal year's budget which includes 94 million dollars to reduce across the board cuts for most Medicaid providers, 70 million dollars for indigent care pool funding for public hospitals and 33.2 million dollars to restore enhancing safety net hospitals. Cutting Medicaid in any other budget year means that New Yorkers already suffer, that hospitals go without, that nursing homes close, and that there are staff shortages. But this year, cutting Medicaid means that a lot of people will die. And older adults and people with disabilities will end up in our emergency rooms because they can't be cared for in their homes and they will also die. And immigrants, black and brown New Yorkers, LGBTQ New Yorkers who can't get care at our community health centers, which are also being cut, uh, will die and healthcare professionals who are already overworked and underpaid, yet still on the front lines, putting themselves in harm's way to keep the rest of us safe, will continue to get infected and die. And so I wanted to um, take a pause here for a second because we know that um, so many of our friends and family have passed away and so many of our neighbors have gotten sick and we need to, um, to recognize that uh, that, that this has been a very difficult time for so many people. Um, sorry, I'm gonna take a pause. Um, we had a previous question in our question and answer and I hope that this will also be helpful, um, but naturally occurring retirement communities, NORCs, and neighborhood naturally occurring retirement communities and NORCs, which are crucial to the comfort and wellness of our seniors throughout my district, will be funded at $4 million each. Um, the settlement houses, which are essential to our community, will be funded at $2.4 million this year. These programs play an integral role in our community. This year, I've written budget letters in support of funding settlement houses and NORCs, and I will continue to fight for additional funding to ensure that these programs are able to adequately support our rapidly aging communities. Um, we have one, a lot of uh, funding in these last couple of years um, to build up the North program. And now we are seeing the, the, those wins um, paying dividends because I think that without the infrastructure that we have been able to set up with the funding that we were able to get, um, that is uh, that we would be in a much worse situation right now for a lot of our seniors in our community. And I promise that we will continue to fight for the funding necessary to ensure that our community organizations and settlement houses receive the crucial funding they need to operate. Our district was hit, um, again, our district was hit by COVID-19 before we as a state knew what the scale of this crisis would be. And we are months ahead in the economic devastation, like I said, of this disease, because um, a lot of our small businesses started to see a lot less foot traffic, especially in Chinatown. There have been racist attacks and our community has not had access to the resources that they need. Um, and all of us in our district have been acutely aware of just how much this pandemic has changed and will change our city and our state. This pandemic has put a harsh spotlight on um, what is going on that we have not been doing on the state and the city level. And um, this is a reality that is not just of this moment, but it will be uh, continuing into our future and made worse by all of the decisions that we've made on the budget, um, but also um, will be worsened if we do not do something now about things that we need to change today. Um, I will continue to fight for the needs of our community in the continuing 
remote legislative session. I hope that we will be able to come back. We need our community to fight for us to come back. And we also need to um, protect our healthcare workers and our essential workers and all of those deeply affected by the ongoing health pandemic. And we will be talking to a lot of those experts. And again, I want to thank all of the electeds. I want to thank Gail, especially for some of the PPEs and the food that she's brought to our district. I want to thank um, my partner, Harvey Epstein, um, and also uh, my two senators, Brian Kavanaugh and Brad Hoylman, for all of the work that you guys have done. You guys are amazing in helping us keep that communication stream. And um, I wanted to say thank you to our um, two city council members who are today unable uh, to join us um, for, for their work as well.